Hello, and thank you so much for joining us today for the webinar Hypomineralized Enamel, MIH, coming to a child near you. It is a great pleasure to introduce you, Dr. David Manton, whose aim during this presentation will be to discuss ways to identify the presence of MIH at an early stage and to be able to create an effective treatment plan. Dr. David Manton graduated BDSC Melbourne in 1984 and worked in general practice until 1991 when he undertook an MDSC in pediatric dentistry. He was dental advisor to the federal government from 1994 till 1996 and won the KG Sutherland Prize of the RACDS in 2007. Dr. Manton is currently the Elfden Story Chair of Child Dental Health and has the Section of Growth and Development at the University of Melbourne and is involved in several collaborative and postgraduate research projects in both pediatric dentistry and orthodontics. David has spoken throughout Australia, Asia and Europe and has wide-ranging experience in laboratory and clinical trials of CPP, ACP, minimal intervention dentistry and the detection of caries. His interests are in all aspects of pediatric dentistry, enamel, D and remineralization, teledentistry, and molar incisal hypermineralization, MIH. We would like to thank Dr. Menten for being with us today and DT Study Club for making this lecture possible. Please take note of any questions and comments you have during the lecture, as they will be addressed by Dr. Menten at the end of the presentation. Without any further delay, please help me welcome the expert himself, Dr. David Menten. Hi everybody, thanks for joining us. Uh, hopefully you can understand my accent and uh, if you can't, feel free to write that as a question as well. So I'm happy you're interested in hypermineralized enamel because over the last 20 years or so, we've realized this is quite an important feature of, that affects children, but obviously has a long-term effect on the teeth of adults as well. So I'll go through the variety of uh, important issues with regard to hypermineralized enamel, starting from simple detection and diagnosis through to some treatment options and then some discussion around treatment planning. Uh, it's always difficult to try and squeeze these things into 45 minutes, but uh, hopefully we'll get there and I'll keep my eye on the clock so I don't overrun as well. So I'll just uh, try and... Ah, here we are. One of the main distinctions that we have trouble with is defining hyperplasia and hypermineralization. The main feature of hyperplasia is thin enamel. So it's a quantitative defect that the ameloblasts are affected quite early on and so there's less matrix secreted and so the enamel in that area is reduced in thickness but in most cases it's of normal quality so the mineralization is normal. This is quite an important distinction between there is quite an important distinction between hyperplasia and hypermineralization because the performance of hypermineralized enamel is markedly different to the performance of hyperplastic enamel. So it's important to know these differences when you're diagnosing the defect. So you can see on these four molars that have been removed from a, a young girl, this line of distinct defect here. So you can see there's a timeline defect through these molars and all molars have been affected in a similar manner at the same time. And this is quite a feature of, of this type of linear hyperplasia that all the teeth developing at that time have some sort of impact on their uh, development. So when you look at the incisor teeth from this child, you can see that in the anterior teeth, there's quite profound impact on the thickness of the enamel. And so we know that this child was probably uh, suffering from some condition in probably between 12 and 24 months of age. So with linear hyperplasia, all the teeth developing at that time tend to be affected. Obviously, we can have individual hyperplastic defects that may relate to infection of a uh, of a precursor primary tooth or trauma to an anterior tooth where the root of the primary tooth bumps into the developing 
uh, permanent tooth. But if it's an overall insult to the child, normally through illness, then you tend to find that the defects affect all those teeth that are forming at that time. So it's a very important distinction. With molar hypermineralization or molar incisor hypermineralization, the defect is quite distinctly different to hyperplasia. A hypermineralized defect is an area of enamel that's in most cases normal thickness, but there's a marked difference in the amount of mineral in that enamel. So as you'd guess from the name, hypermineralized enamel has less mineral in it than normal sound enamel. The interesting thing about MH molar hypermen or molar incisor hypermineralization is that there's not that distinct pattern through all of the teeth developing at that time. What you find is that many of the teeth uh, are sound. So you might find a distribution of one or two affected molars to perfectly normal molars and all incisors normal. But what we do find is some sort of spectrum where the more severe the molars are, the more likely the incisors are to be affected. The distinct lesion is a demarcated opacity, distinct from diffuse opacities such as in fluorotic lesions. And so definition-wise, it's important to understand these uh, distinctions between hyperplasia and hypermineralization because they can affect how you treatment plan for these children markedly because the hypermineralized enamel leads to normally far poorer restorative outcomes for these teeth. So when you think of the defect in a pathophysiological way, it becomes quite confusing why teeth forming at the same time aren't all affected in the same way. And I don't think we know why this occurs. We have some theories that I'll talk about later, but it is a confusing condition because of this variability of severity and variability of teeth affected. You can see this variety of teeth, and these are from a study done by uh, one of our past postgrads, Harleen Kumar, that you can see these teeth have incredible variability. From this one in the top left, where we've got a large lesion with secondary caries, to a tooth with just some very mild lesions, to again, others with large defects in different parts of the teeth. This is quite you know, distinct to this condition, that we do get this variability between teeth within the patient and between patients. So it makes it more difficult to treatment plan because you often have teeth that have different treatment needs and different prognoses, all in the same patient. So don't expect if you're diagnosing MIH to be seeing distinct defects that are similar within the patient. You can get marked variability, and as we said before, you can get difference in teeth affected. So it is, again, a confusing and difficult condition to deal with, but we'll go through you know, some of the answers that we have for these teeth. So the defects vary in presentation and in colour. So you can see here we've got... Oh, let's grab our arrow. We've got a distinct white demarcated lesion. This is quite mild in nature. And when we look at the prognosis of this defect, it probably won't markedly affect the performance of this tooth at all. It's in an area that doesn't bear any stress. And normally the white lesions are more mineralized than the yellow brown. So the general rule is the more colored the lesion, the worse the physical characteristics are due to less mineral in those colored lesions compared to white lesions. When we look at the lower tooth, you can see that we've had marked post-eruptive breakdown, subsequent caries, and this is often why they're confused with hyperplasia, because by the time the dentist actually looks at the tooth, the enamel has gone. And so the, the uh, assumption is that that enamel, enamel wasn't there in the first place, whereas in most of these teeth, the enamel is so weak that it actually breaks down or dissolves quite readily. And so it's not there when you actually see the tooth. And when you look at this lower tooth, 
you can imagine that you know, restoratively this is a huge challenge. Normally these teeth present in young children, so they're the last tooth in the arch. Obviously if it's a six or seven year old, the uh, mouth is quite small. This is the last tooth and often you know, in themselves they're restoratively challenging. So with that behavioural overlay as well, they can become quite a problem in children. So when you're looking in a child's mouth and maybe you see teeth such as these, what we need to do is then come up with some idea of what's the appropriate treatment both in the short term and in the long term. And as we go through the lecture, we'll have some ideas on looking at these yellow brown lesions in this image, maybe what the evidence base is for the best treatment to decrease the treatment load that these teeth often bring with them. When you look at this next image, you can see that we have some mild lesions here, some more severe lesions here, but they're still light in nature. So there's probably more mineral in these lesions than in the previous image. The one distinction between these cases is that you can see there are distinct cavitated curious lesions. What we do know, and this is from Agarie Garnham's work in Iraq, is that children who have higher caries risk get worse outcomes with their hypermineralized teeth. So understanding caries risk in the child is also very important because it plays a role in the outcome of these teeth and therefore it plays a role when we're treatment planning for these teeth. So it is quite important to be checking the caries risk of the child, trying to moderate that of course, but knowing that the caries risk will impact on the performance of these uh, developmentally defective teeth. So just in general, when we look at the features, there's less mineral. In work that Felicity Crombie has done, you know, up to 60% decrease in mineral. And when you look at carious lesions, in most cases when they're getting to 60% decrease in mineral content, they're starting to cavitate. So it shows how weak and how much mineral is missing from these lesions. And that also explains their clinical performance, but also creates a challenge for us to try and replace or put back mineral that didn't, uh, wasn't there in the first place. The protein content has also significantly increased. Uh, in our work up to 14 times, in some work from Rami Farrar in New Zealand, uh, he had even more protein in these uh, lesions. Most of the protein is albumin. And as you know, albumin is a globular protein and so will sit on the surface of the crystal. And we think that has some role in why the lesions are hypermineralized, that the albumin acts as a, as a retardant to normal mineralization, you know, and nearly as a, a crystallization poison. So the protein is very important. You know, in normal healthy enamel, it's very low level. So to have you know, 14 to 18 times more protein in these lesions does have a marked impact on the physical performance of the tooth because of its uh, effect on the mineralization. But the protein may also act as an inhibitor to further remineralization. So we'll speak about some research uh, our group has done looking at changing that protein content, trying to improve bond strengths, and then hopefully in the future we'll also be able to use that to try and improve uh, the mineral content with remineralizing agents. The appearance can be affected. In molar teeth, this appearance is more important with respect to diagnosing the severity of the lesion. But in anterior teeth, especially in older children, it can become an issue that they're not happy with how their front teeth look. And so that then brings in the, uh, the issue of you know, aesthetic intervention, whether we're veneering the teeth with direct you know, resin composite, whether we need to bleach the teeth to try and decrease the colour of the lesions before we veneer them. You know, there are a whole lot of issues that come out of this appearance of anterior teeth that are se severely affected especially. So it tends to be the yellow-brown lesions that are more of a problem, but in some children the white lesions can become a problem as well. So when we look at 
the physical characteristics, they can also be affected markedly as we uh, mentioned. This relates to the mineral content. Uh, the, with the mineral content decreased by up to 60%, the hardness can also be affected markedly, the fracture resistance is affected. And so the enamel is quite liable to be broken down, especially when it comes into occlusal force. So lesions that are on cusp tips, and that's often an area that's affected, are far more likely to break down quickly because they come into occlusal uh, force much earlier than other areas. So it's something to be quite aware of, and it also, again, creates a challenge for us to work out ways of how we can improve these physical characteristics uh, to improve the long-term outcome for the teeth. The other issue is that there's more carbonated mineral in the enamel. You'd know that uh, impure hydroxyapatite is the normal description of enamel, that it has a variety of, of different calcium and phosphate salts in there. If there's fluoride in the environment, there'll be fluorapatite, as well as hydroxyapatite and with other products such as magnesium and sodium in there as well. These teeth can have up to 60% more carbonated mineral and the carbonated mineral is markedly more soluble than hydroxyapatite. So carbonated apatite will preferentially dissolve and it's one of the reasons these teeth don't do very well in caries risk patients because it dissolves very readily. If there's fluoride in the environment and it's quite a healthy environment, you tend to find that you do get the development of a reasonably sound surface layer on the hypermineralized lesions. So the carbonated appetite is also quite an important feature. The etiological factors are probably the most difficult issues we've had to deal with. Uh, we did a study uh, led by Felicity Crombie quite a number of years ago looking at papers regarding the etiology and we didn't find any distinct evidence that pointed to one or two main factors. We know that it relates to childhood illness. Uh, we can look at a population in, say, a children's hospital and see far more hypermineralization than you'd see in a healthy population. But you'll still see a number of children who have no obvious medical condition in their history that would lead to a higher prevalence of this condition. So again, it's quite confusing that there are num obviously a number of etiological factors, especially when you consider the high prevalence, but it's just so far been impossible to actually point to one or two. But I think if you consider that any child who's had severe illness you know, during the first maybe two years of life, especially closer to birth, uh, that they are at higher chance of being at a risk of having hypermineralized teeth. We can also say that with the mothers, those that have uh, health issues in the last trimester of pregnancy also have children who have a higher prevalence of hypermineralized teeth. So there are some simple you know, rules around who may be at higher risk, but there are no specific etiological factors that have been determined so far. So there's a lot of research to be done in this area to try and determine who's at risk and whether we can do anything about that risk during the development of the tooth. Prevalence is quite variable. Worldwide, you know, the prevalence ranges from around 3% up to 40%. There are a number of reasons why there's this huge variability. Uh, sometimes it's the way the data is collected, in which population the data is collected. So you have to be aware of these factors that may uh, vary this prevalence. And I've just included in the next few slides, because I'm sitting here in Leuven, some European data that will give you an idea of the uh, variation in the data just coming from Europe. Uh, these spreadsheets come, and I'll talk about this website uh, towards the end, from the T D3 Group website. So it's actually www.thed3group.org. And that holds a whole wealth of information, more than 100 pages of information on MIH that you might find very uh, useful for yourself. But we've also aimed a lot of the information at children and their parents as well. So as a backup to what we're talking about today, you might find that website uh, 
which is freely open, you might find it of value. But you can see on this first page we've got variation from 25% down to 9%. This is in primary molars here with Marlies Elfrink's work. 40% but in a paediatric dentistry practice population, which is the reason Richard Balmer's prevalence is quite high, but again down to 6% in Germany. So again, marked variation, the same here between Italy, Spain, and then Lithuania and Bosnia-Herzegovina. So when you get marked variation between prevalence uh, levels between reasonably similar, similar populations, you look for reasons, and as we mentioned before, they're normally that we're not using the same data collection methods, we're not recording the data in the same way, or that they're actually true prevalence differences, probably due to different etiological factors affecting those populations at any one time. At the moment, we haven't worked out why these variations exist. So it's probably a combination of those. With respect to collecting data on prevalence, you'll find in the reasonably near future that via the European Academy of Paediatric Dentistry, we'll be publishing some guidelines on how to run prevalence studies. We'll be providing a variety of forms with respect to collecting the data uh, and also methodology information so you can uh, train your examiners, you can uh, look at the inter examiner variabilities and also how to do statistics on the, the results. So if you keep an eye on the European uh, Academy of Paediatric Dentistry website, hopefully before the end of the year that information will be available and freely available. So when we come down to the tooth level, we see there are a number of factors that are important. The increased caries susceptibility is probably the main reason these teeth provide problems for us. Because if, especially if they're severely affected, they do break down very readily. And as we mentioned, the caries risk affects this outcome as well. They etch and they bond abnormally. So what you find is that the success of your bonding, especially with composite resin or resin composite, is markedly reduced. Whether that bond breaks down at the interface between the, the resin composite and the enamel or whether it's actually enamel breakdown is still not known. It's probably a combination of both. But you'll find that marginal integrity in, with your restorations is not a long-term uh, condition in these teeth. So you have to be cautious about reviewing the integrity of your restorations and not treating them as though the enamel is normal. And this makes us think of, would any pretreatment improve our bond strengths and the bond security? Or even resin infiltration, will this make any difference and improve the bond strengths and performance of our restorative uh, interventions? And I'll talk a little bit about those, these two factors here a little bit later. What these factors lead to are very poor restorative outcomes. So we know from uh, Yalovic's work that by nine, these children have had up to 10 times as much dental care as a child without the condition. So obviously that has some impact on behavior as well. So these poor restorative outcomes are something that we need to try and reduce the failure of our restorations. And whether this is by intervention or more aggressive treatment planning, we'll discuss. It also brings in the issue of surface protection that if we see these teeth erupting, should we be thinking about surface protecting as soon as we see that surface? And whether that's surface protection with uh, low viscosity glass armor cement, with a fluoride varnish, uh, with other remineralizing agents, we'll talk about. But it's something that I think is becoming more important that we recognize the condition early and try and do as much as possible to protect the surface and provide a remineralizing environment so that we can improve the physical characteristics of the enamel. Clinically, what do we have trouble with? A very common problem that we see is they're difficult to access because they're the most posterior tooth in the mouth of a small child. Local analgesia is very difficult to get, especially in sensitive teeth. So 
what you'll find in some of these teeth is even though your uh, local analgesia appears to be working from the soft tissue signs that we look for, often the tooth will still be sensitive. And Helen Rod and her group in Sheffield in the UK have done work here indicating that it's probably chronic inflammatory change in the pulp that causes this problem. But a general rule we tend to say is if the child complains about discomfort, you tend to believe the child and believe that your local analgesia is not effective. And this obviously makes it very difficult to treat some of these children because it's uncomfortable. And as you'll see in the, probably the next slide, sometimes we need to resort to going to general anaesthetic so that we can treat these children humanely. Stabilisation is an issue that we talk about quite a bit, but sometimes the most effective thing we can do in the short term is stabilise the tooth, try and decrease the sensitivity, decrease further breakdown, so that we can actually create an effective treatment plan. We then think of which material we should be using, and I think that is dependent on how long you want to stabilise the tooth for, so in the shorter periods, you can be using you know, low viscosity materials, uh, GIC materials or higher viscosity GIC materials. You know, for us, uh, we call them Fuji 7 or Fuji 9. So uh, triage, Fuji triage or Fuji Equia are materials we'll use commonly. And you can see here, this is a, a Fuji triage stabilization. You need to think which teeth are worth stabilizing or whether you need to do a definitive restoration or even extract the tooth as well. So it's a complicated treatment planning process when these teeth are so markedly affected in a lot of cases. And so the treatment planning really needs a lot of thought, especially in severely affected cases. We need to even think of something similar. Where do I finish the margins of my restorative care? Do I need to remove all the hypermineralized enamel or can I actually finish up against mildly affected hypermineralized enamel. So there are a lot of questions we have and unfortunately in some of the cases we don't actually have scientific evidence about what the answer should be. So we often have to go on just our clinical experience. At the patient end, what do they suffer from with this condition? Sensitivity is a problem that's commonly reported uh, if a tooth is sensitive, often you'll see the child earlier than if it isn't sensitive because it's the reason for presenting. You know, caries risk, as we mentioned before, that they have often been during their childhood at low caries risk. And then after the eruption of these six-year-old molars, we suddenly realise that they're getting a very rapid breakdown of the teeth and subsequent caries, often due to inability to clean the teeth. And if they're sensitive, you know, a reluctance to clean the teeth because it hurts when they brush. The issue regarding the sensitivity and also the difficulty in gaining uh, good local analgesia often leads to dental phobia or an extreme anxiety. So often these children with quite marked treatment needs also have the most challenging behaviour to deal with. So the dental phobia brings in a whole raft of other clinical problems that we need to deal with. If we're thinking about general anaesthesia, obviously there are marked, depending which system you work in, there are often marked treatment costs involved because you're looking at a surgery cost, an anaesthetist cost, and then the dental cost. And there are obviously risks involved with general anaesthesia, even though they're low, they're existent, and these need to be discussed with the patient and the parent, obviously. And then sometimes, as we mentioned before, there are aesthetic issues. And as the enamel, affected enamel is not normal and does not bond normally, these bring in some challenges as well. So the children affected by these conditions can be challenging at a number of levels, both for us as clinicians, but also for them as the patient. And we need to be aware of these issues because they do impact on the way we treat and the way we treat and plan. So we come back to this case again and we start thinking, what should we be doing with these relatively newly erupted six-year-old molars? Should we be surface protecting? Should we be applying products such as fluoride varnish or tooth mousse or MI paste? There's not a lot of evidence around, certainly scientific evidence. 
There's quite a lot of clinical anecdote that would suggest that a low viscosity glass on a cement placed as a sealant over this enamel decreases sensitivity and in some way protects the enamel. And then remineralizing agents will also help with the sensitivity and from lab studies it would suggest they also help with improving the mineral content of the teeth. So even though there's not a vast amount of scientific evidence, the clinical anecdote would suggest that these methods will improve what happens to these teeth. There's also some evidence that products with stannous fluoride improve the sensitivity of these teeth. Again, not published, but there have been enough clinicians talking to us indicating that toothpaste and tooth gels with stannous fluoride does decrease the sensitivity. Differentially, what do we need to look at? Fluorosis, these are diffuse lesions of enamel. So they're distinct from the demarcated. So when you look at fluorotic lesions, all enamel developing at the time that the uh, increase in dose of fluoride has occurred should be affected by the fluorosis. So if they're diffuse opacities, they tend to be fluorotic in nature. The white spot lesions, often you'll find the demarcated lesions related to hypermineralization aren't in areas that are affected by carious white spots. With our group's research, we've rarely, if not never, found hypermineralized lesions in the cervical third of the tooth. And that's commonly where you see white spot lesions, apart from in the fissure systems. So differentially, diagnosing between these shouldn't be too difficult. The myelogenesis imperfecta will affect all teeth, including the primary teeth. So that's one way of diagnosing between these two conditions. Gross caries is probably the hardest. But often these teeth are grossly carious due to hypermineralized enamel. And so differentiating between gross caries and hypermineralized related gross caries is sometimes difficult. But often looking for the pattern in which these lesions appear can help you differentially diagnose. So often the hypermineralized lesions will be in an asymmetric pattern that doesn't follow areas that normally get caries. So think about the caries risk of the patient if these heavily affected recently erupted six-year-old molars doesn't fit with that normal pattern, then what you'll often find is it's related to hypermineralized or developmentally defective teeth. So look for patterns. And as I mentioned, in a lot of these cases, the primary teeth aren't affected and haven't been affected by dental caries. And so there's no reason why six-year-old molars should be uniquely affected by caries without an otherwise high caries risk child. So think of patterns of caries. So with the caries risk of the individual, if it's low and you've got affected sixes, our first thought would be, are these sixes hypermineralized? So caries in other teeth lead you to maybe diagnose it's just normal caries and so the teeth can be treated as though they're caries. But if you diagnose hypermineralized enamel, you will probably treat these teeth in a different way. Another giveaway is atypical caries in the second primary molars. What we're finding with recent research, the initial research coming from Marley Selfrink in Amsterdam, is that uh, around 9 or 10% of children are affected with hypermineralized second primary molars. And we know that there's a link between the second primary molars with hypermineralization and the first permanent molars with hypermineralization. So sometimes look for atypical caries in these second primary molars, as that may be the indicator of why the six year old molars are hypermineralized as well, because there is overlap in the developmental time of these teeth. When we're looking clinically, we do tend to look at caries risk quite simplistically at the start. So with children, we've found in the past that doing salivary testing can sometimes be a bit difficult for especially the young child. So we tend to use this three-tone gel as a very quick way of assessing caries risk. And those of you who haven't used it, the, the lighter ready purple color is quite young or fresh plaque. The darker blue is older plaque or more mature plaque. And the light blue is actually cariogenic plaque. 
So when the light blue colour appears after application of this gel, you know that that area has got quite a low pH and would actually be getting demineralised at the time that that biofilm is sitting there. So it's often a very easy way of checking the effectiveness of their oral hygiene, but also whether their biofilm is karyogenic. As we mentioned, children at higher caries risk have worse outcomes for these teeth. So it's important that we check this risk. The variable presentation within the mouth is also something that confuses people with respect to diagnosis. So these are teeth from one mouth and you can see this tooth quite markedly affected with post-eruptive breakdown and subsequent caries, whereas this upper molar looks relatively normal. So again, it's confusing in both a diagnostic sense, but also it makes treatment planning difficult. And you can see in these mandibular teeth that there's variable presentation as well. This tooth has been temporised and that temporary restoration had failed. But you can see here, quite a marked lesion. So huge inter-person variability. Intra-person, I should say. When we look at primary molars, you can see that there's an unusual pattern of enamel loss and enamel colour in this tooth. There's an atypical restoration in this tooth. Why would you have a DO restoration in this tooth when it doesn't have a contact point? And again, here, unusual enamel loss. So these are good points or good signs to help you diagnose that there's hypermineralized enamel. These are some photos from Marley Selfrink, and this is a very typical appearance of a hypermineralized second primary molar. So they're nearly pathognomonic. And this is the upper arch in this child. And again, this missing distopalatal area is quite common with hypermineralized second primary molars. But you can see on the other side, the presentation is a little bit different. But I think you'd agree that this is very atypical for caries. So the presentation of the condition often leads you to the diagnosis. And this is the paper that you'll find those images in. You'll often see from OPGs, and we call this a moth-eaten appearance, but this atypical appearance of a relatively recently erupted molar, healthy primary teeth, and then here in the upper first molar, you can see massive destruction that doesn't tie in with the caries risk of the child or with the normal caries process. So even radiographically, you can start you know, getting your preliminary diagnoses without even seeing the child. But obviously you'd confirm that with a good clinical examination. You can get crossover with fluorosis and, hypermineral and MIH. So you can see here, this is fluorotic lesions following the developmental lines of the teeth, but then quite a marked lesion with post-eruptive breakdown on this incisor, and the post-eruptive breakdown is quite unusual on incisor teeth. We know the history with respect to fluoride ingestion of this child, so we can be reasonably accurate, and all first, primary mol all first permanent molars were affected. Here's the twin brother, a different presentation, but with fluorotic lesions, but also demarcated lesions. Same fluoride history, six-year-old molars affected. Hyperplastic lesions, you can see, are different. These are post-trauma, post-illness, markedly different to hypermineralized lesions. Amelogenesis imperfecta, imperfect, pitted type, all teeth affected. To a different degree, but all teeth affected. A different presentation of amelogenesis imperfecta, hypercalcified type, again, all teeth affected. Whereas with MIH, it tends to be the incisors and the molars. But the molars have to be affected for it to be MIH. This is some of Monty de Gaulle's work. You can see here a typical restoration. Again, carry or restoration of breakdown and subsequent caries that doesn't follow a normal pattern. When you're treating the child, there are certain things you need to consider. Has the tooth been sensitive? Because it has, then it might be more difficult to get reasonable local analgesia. 
and then you start thinking if there are there may be more than one tooth affected well I need general anaesthetic to treat this tooth and should that treat my affect my treatment plan and normally we would be more aggressive if we're using general anaesthesia so we would certainly extract more teeth if we're using a GA because we want certainty of outcome. We think is the tooth restorable? Is there substance for restoration? Where are our margins? This definition of non-carious margins is very difficult. Can I bond to hypermineralized enamel? And the answer is not as well as sound enamel. So determination of margins is difficult and often means you cut a lot of tooth structure. Sometimes you just have to look at the tooth such a tooth here and say it's not restorable, we probably need to extract. Clinically, we have sensitivity, we have lower bond strengths, we have cohesive failure in the enamel if the enamel is severely affected. We have trouble thinking where do we finish our margins and we have subsequent trouble with respect to maintaining those restorative margins. We can improve the mineral content of this enamel. This is work by Felicity Crombie from our group. But if we look over the full depth of the lesion in this dark area is the lesion. This is the area exposed to remineralizing agent, which was casein phosphopeptide amorphous calcium fluoride phosphate. But over the full depth, we got around 28% improvement in, that, in mineralization. But over the first 50 microns, we got nearly two thirds of mineral content put back in. This is laboratory, not clinical, but it leads us to believe we can change the mineral content. It improves the hardness markedly. You can see you know, close to 300% improvement of hardness. So that mineralization does bring with it better physical characteristics. So again, when we come back to this case, when we look at the surface of what apparently is unbroken down hypermineralized enamel, it tends to be filled with a lot of these surface pores. And they can be quite large. Some of these are up to nearly 10 microns across. And we think this is probably one of the reasons why they become sensitive is that it allows quite a lot of fluid transfer, but also allows bacterial invasion. But again, there's more work needed to be done in this area. And this, this imagery is from uh, Felicity Crombie. What we tend to do is cover the teeth in a low viscosity glass on a cement. And when we think about those pores, maybe this is why that procedure is effective because we're covering up those pores. But again, this is supposition. It's not published science. Restoratively, we have a number of choices that we can use with uh, hypermineralized teeth. In general, we use composite resin, stainless steel crowns. These are restorative procedures in children. You may want to consider other materials later on, but the evidence would suggest that these two options are the most successful options. We would cover the dentine in a glass on a cement and then cover this with composite or fully cover the tooth with stainless steel crown. We can improve bond strengths. When we look at this work by Huiling Che, when sodium hypochlorite was used for a minute after etching, and it's important that it's after etching, we got quite a significant improvement in bond strength. The normal bond strength in this group was around 29 megapascals. So we can get the bond strength up to around 80% of normal, which is a marked improvement on previous research. We tried infiltrating, and infiltration, when we don't consider sodium hypochlorite pretreatment, didn't make a huge difference. But there's a table I'm not showing you that would indicate that if we infiltrated as well as pretreated with sodium hypochlorite, we did get some improvement in bond strength. If we're stabilizing, we need to think, why are we stabilizing? So for what reason are we stabilizing? For orthodontic reasons, for behavior reasons, for reasons that we don't have a good treatment plan. So we need to consider the reason why we're stabilizing and which material. And we discussed that previously. So are we stabilizing because we're going to crown the tooth? That we're going to, the tooth isn't erupted to do a stainless steel 
crown, so we're going to stabilise until the tooth is erupted enough to place a stainless steel crown or to extract at an appropriate time. Is the pulp vital? Are the roots fully formed? Is there an inflammatory change at the periapex? We need to consider these issues. If the six isn't fully developed, does that periapical change make any difference to our treatment planning? And our belief is if the pulp responds reasonably normally to sensibility testing, then we certainly treat the pulp very conservatively, seal the tooth off, whether it's stabilised or stainless steel crown, and often you'll find the pulpal symptoms and the radiographic signs will go away. This is Yalovic's work showing that at nine, these children have had 10 times as much care as children without the condition. So we need to treat the children carefully because they've had such a treatment load. When we're considering extraction, if it's a simple process of extraction and no other orthodontic care, then our simple rule would be we extract when the furca of the lower seven, the lower 12-year-old molar becomes apparent. This tends to give us the best outcome. When you look at this case study or case series published by Birgit Jalovic, you can see that going from seven when the teeth were extracted through to nearly nine when the 12-year-old molars are erupting, through to 10 and through to nearly 14, that there's a reasonable result coming from just extraction therapy. But I think you need to be cautious and consider these factors of how old the child is, what their dental age is, how psychologically developed they are, and are there overlying orthodontic issues? Because you may want to use the space from these compromised teeth to help the orthodontist. So we always think it's important that you get an expert opinion. So whether that is from a paediatric dentist regarding the restorative or exodontive care, or whether it's from an orthodontist regarding the orthodontic overlay, that you need, if you're not uh, suitably experienced yourself, to ask someone for some help and some information. So summarising, if we're talking about extraction of sixes, if you're unsure whether this is the best treatment, stabilise. Consider the number of extractions required on the behaviour of the child and consider their orthodontic requirements. We do see hypermineralised primary molars, as I mentioned before, but as you can see from this case, a lot of teeth can be affected. These primary canines are affected. When you look at these hypermineralised E's, the best treatment option for teeth like this, especially in a young child, and this child is three, is to stainless steel crown them. Minimal prep, glass on them, a cement, stainless steel crown. And this will give you a good long-term result. Intracoronal restorations on those teeth uh, suffer from very poor outcomes. So just summarising, when we look at these lesions, what are the problems or what are the issues? We have decreased mineral content. They're softer, they're more porous, there's more carbonate content. The organisation of the enamel is quite unusual. We can get a surface layer if we give it a, a healthy remineralizing environment. The cervical regions are rarely affected. The colour tends to indicate the severity of the lesion, so the darker ones are more severe. We can get resin infiltration, but it's unpredictable, so more research needs to go into that. We can mature the enamel with remineralizing agents, with products such as CPP, ACP, and that will improve the physical characteristics and the outcomes of the teeth, and pretreatment can improve these outcomes as well. So plan for the future. Do as little as possible and try and provide the restorative dentist of the future with as much structure as you can and communicate to the parents and the child about what the condition is and why it has occurred and what their future treatment needs are. There'll be some information available, and GC's been fantastic with supporting our, our work into uh, molar hypermin. So these products uh, are available at the moment in English, and we're hoping they'll be translated into other languages in the future. And they're great for providing information to parents and children. There's also a promotion now on surface protection that in the near future will be coming up with respect to hypermineralization as well, trying to decrease them the treatment uh, need for these patients. 
And also, I'd like to thank, in the end, our group. This is the website for you, for our, our developmental defects group, and also GC for sponsoring me in this talk. So uh, thank you very much for listening, and I'm now happy to answer questions if you'd like. OK, nice question. We've had a question about general anaesthesia and sometimes whether conscious sedation is suitable for the child. And certainly, uh, conscious sedation or relative analgesia can be used very successfully in children. You do get some change in the pain threshold in these children, but sometimes these teeth are so exquisitely sensitive, you'll need to sedate the child quite heavily to be able to get them through this extreme pain. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't matter how many times you give local analgesia, they don't you know, go numb. So relative analgesia or conscious sedation can certainly be very helpful in the cases. So yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, and then what is the name of the gel that reveals the risk of caries? It's, uh, strangely enough, it's made by GC and it's called from memory, triplark. Yeah. So we've been using that. It used to be two-tone, and then more recently it's become three-tone. And we've been using that for more than a year now, and we find it a very simple and effective way of establishing caries risk. Uh, if the caries risk doesn't seem to make sense with what other factors we're hearing from the parents and the child, we'll then also often test saliva. Uh, but what we found is in children, we'll often get a really good idea of caries risk just from using this gel. And it's quite easy to use. Uh, and again, this isn't science, but our feeling is we get a be better behaviour change when we actually show the child and the parent that imagery because you can point out caries risk areas rather than everything just looking red, which was the problem in the past. Ah, someone's asking, how... How young can you give MI paste? And uh, we call it Tooth Mousse Plus in Australia, but MI paste has 900 ppm sodium fluoride. The main risk factor that we see is the fluoride content. So my normal feeling is that I wouldn't give, or I wouldn't ask a child to swallow fluoridated toothpaste, uh, you know, especially when they're young. So what you tend to find with MI paste and Tooth Mousse is they swallow the product. So fluorosis risk is the issue that sits in the background for us. We tend to be conservative and say 10 years of age. When you think about tooth development, six or seven is probably okay, but I lean on the conservative side. So I tend to say around 10, and it's pretty it's easier to remember because that's the first time they get to double figures with age. But if you think about tooth development, it could probably come in earlier. What you find with MI paste is you get around 20% better mineralization than you do with tooth mousse. But if you use tooth mousse after brushing the teeth with fluoridated toothpaste, you will make that residual fluoride work a lot better. So that's generally what we tend to do in children uh, of the MIH age, is use tooth mousse after they've brushed their teeth with an adult strength toothpaste. So whether that's a thousand parts per million or thirteen fifty, so a good question. So okay, Marilyn, are crowns recommended in adults if we see a restored tooth with an amalgam? Uh, look, I think with with crowns, you know, I'm a kids dentist, but I did do fifteen or so years of general dentistry. You need to make the decision individually on whether you need to fully cover the tooth. Uh, if you think that initial restoration, and whether it's due, due to MIH or caries, has weakened the tooth significantly, you obviously discuss with the patient whether you know, coverage of the tooth will give them much better long-term success. So I don't know whether there's a golden rule for that one. When we use stainless steel crowns in hypermineralized teeth, we're always explaining to the patient, the parent, that this is the first step in a long restorative path for the tooth. And often when you explain that path, the likelihood of extraction goes up because they realise that these teeth do have poor, especially if they're severely affected, do have poor long-term survival. 
So if we can maximize the benefit of removing the teeth and minimize the orthodontic impact, that's often the best long-term uh, treatment option we can use. Okay, uh, what is the difference between the CPP containing products and Remin Pro? Uh, there's quite a marked difference. Uh, probably the first difference I see, and I have to admit I have a bias because I've been part of the, the group that researches CPP ACP, is that there's now more than 150 papers about CPP ACP published, and I don't know any papers regarding Remin Pro. CPP ACP provides ionic calcium and phosphate that's stabilised by the casein phosphopeptide, whereas Remin Pro basically has medical hydroxyapatite that tends to be quite insoluble, and so the bioavailability of the calcium and the phosphate is totally limited by saturation. So once calcium and phosphate, and especially when it's got fluoride present, reaches saturation, you get precipitation. That happens very quickly, so it tends not to be integrated into the enamel. It tends to sit on the surface of the enamel, which isn't remineralization, it's surface precipitation. Whereas the CPP ACP has control over how much calcium and phosphate is released. And so if you look at the research, you'll see that you get quite good and deep and very secure remineralization from the product. So that's the main difference between the products is one has a lot of evidence to show it's very effective clinically and as far as I know the other one has very little evidence. So with the bonding systems, look, I think it's really what works in your hands. As we mentioned, the, the use of pretreatment after etching seems to improve the bond strengths and that research initially came from an orthodontist looking at brackets falling off uh, hypermineralized or hypercalcified amelogenesis imperfecta patients. And there have been a couple of studies since. But I think any bonding system that works for you will probably you know, be equally as, a, as successful as any other bonding system. There's, I know of no evidence to show one works better than the other. So I think it's probably just the bonding system you normally use. So the question about is there prevalence data in an Asian country? There's some initial prevalence data in Singapore that shows from memory similar sort of prevalence figures uh, um, around from memory 14%, 12 to 14%. There were some variations between people with different ethnic backgrounds, so between Malays, Indians and Chinese, with the Chinese prevalence being a bit lower. Uh, I haven't seen that published yet, but I believe it's in the process of being published. Uh, we should have some data for you very soon. We're undertaking a study in Malaysia at the moment. So hopefully that data will be published uh, next year, we hope. But from our initial feelings, we're getting similar prevalence in most Asian countries, though the study that has the lowest prevalence of around 3% comes out of Hong Kong. But those children were a bit older, so sometimes you get lower prevalence figures in older populations because the hypermineralized teeth have either been extracted or the severely affected areas have been restored, so you miss the hypermineralization. So, good question. Do you use compromise for restoring or stabilizing the teeth? Uh, we don't use compromise at all. We would normally consider that if we've got control of the environment to be good enough to use a compromise, we'd cover dentine in GRC and then use composite resin over the top. So that's more clinical experience than research-based evidence, because uh, I don't know of any evidence regarding the success of compromers in these teeth. But again, if they work in your hands, use them. But we know that long-term, these are permanent teeth, that I think you'd rather have composite resin in the teeth because it's uh, more fracture resistant, you know, more wear resistant than complement. But again, that's, that's personal information. So, Mary Beth, can you use non-fluoridated MI paste in young children? Yeah, uh, well, yes, the tooth mousse is what we call it. Uh, maybe in the States it's called MI paste. Uh, we certainly use that in children of nearly any age. 
Uh, I know in the instructions it tends to indicate don't use it in children under six, but as far as I'm concerned there are no contraindications unless the child has a milk allergy or an allergy to any of the other constituents why you wouldn't use it. And if you use the tooth mousse or unfluoridated MI paste, after the application of fluoridated toothpaste it will complex the fluoride and make it far more persistent in the mouth. So in young children we tend to use it after they've brushed their teeth at night because then they go to bed, their salivary flow goes down and so the product stays around in the mouth a lot longer. So we tend to think, even though there's no published evidence, that that sounds like it's a good idea. So they keep on coming, which is good. If a child has MIH, does it mean uh, she, uh, he or she will get MIH in the perm? Yeah, okay. There's certainly at least double the chance if you have hypermineralized second primary molars that you'll have hypermineralized six-year-old molars. So it's a bit of a foreteller. So you can sort of not warn or advise the parent and the child, most likely the parent, that if they have hypermineralized second primary molars that we really need to keep a close eye on the first permanent molars because they have a much higher risk of being affected. And the reason we want to keep a close eye on them is what we were discussing before, that it appears that surface protection is probably not a bad idea for these teeth. And we're looking at at the moment, there's some anecdotal evidence and we've published a little bit of it, that through thin layers of glass ionomer cement we may be able to get some change in mineral content of the enamel because thin layers of glass ionomer cement are quite porous. But that's very initial work, it's more uh, observation than science and so we still need to do a lot more research on that but it hopefully will be the case that we can protect the surface physically and then improve the mineralization through that. So uh, watch this space but it will probably be a year or two before you see any results. So I think I've worn everyone out. There are no more questions. So uh, thank you very much for listening and uh, hopefully we get to chat again. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Menten, for sharing your lecture and your insightful information with us. We'd also like to thank DT Study Club for making this online course possible. And thank you, our wonderful audience, for your interest and participation. The C quiz is now available online on the course page, and completing it will allow you to earn your ADA SERP CE credits. The recording will be posted online within the next 48 hours. You will receive an email notification with a link to the recording. Further questions for Dr. Menten will be submitted directly on the website, on the courses page, under the Ask the Expert tab. So go ahead and submit your questions, and Dr. Menten will be sure to get back to you as soon as possible. Please be sure to visit the DT Study Club educational platform, www.dtstudyclub.com, and keep an eye out for our growing schedule of online courses. Thank you again to all. Take care, and goodbye.